Welcome to day four. In our last two videos, we focused on 3D conceptual design tools. We hope you've had a chance to try Schema for yourself. These next videos dive into the implications of the new tools coming online to the business of architecture. Whether you're a principal in a firm or a job captain, your job is changing. We'll lay out some of the implications for the industry. And as a reminder, day five is a Q&A webinar where we will answer your questions. Let us know what questions you've come up with so far as you've gone through the sustainability challenge. Well, welcome everybody. I wanna introduce our first special guest, Christina Bach, who is the president of Blue Ocean Sustainability and a licensed architect. Hey, Christina, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me here. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, just cover your background maybe a little bit. Uh, I know that you started Blue Ocean Sustainability a couple of years ago to build some web-based tools like True Carbon around measurement of embodied carbon and operating carbon. Uh, can you just go into your background as an architect and, and, and what you've been doing recently? Yeah, um, so I came out of school, grad school during the middle of the recession and like a lot of my peers got laid off, had trouble finding a job and got really interested in sustainability and sort of the readaptation of buildings and how we could kind of use what we already had as opposed to just starting with brand new. And so with that, I actually joined USGBC as their first in-house reviewer when they went to build their internal review team and spent quite a bit of time working on lead projects and sort of understanding how folks actually approach sustainability um, in the documentation sort of an achievement process. And from there, you know, I was able to leverage that into a career working in a wide variety of different um, capacities with owners directly from the design side as an architect, from sort of a consultant side to just helping out with certification work and really looking at the challenges that individuals in the design and construction industry face related to how to actually implement sustainability. Um, and so I started Blue Ocean Sustainability a few years ago and really focused on the idea of how do we make the whole sustainability journey easier and more accessible for folks so that they can get real-time information earlier in the process to help leverage sort of better outcomes for the whole industry as opposed to just the premier projects that can afford a deluxe sort of consultant or, you know, the ambitious goals. Mm -hmm. So, and I know that it wasn't that long ago that you were a practicing licensed architect and still are a licensed architect mm -hmm. working on healthcare projects, other commercial projects, um, just seeing that side of the business, right? Yeah, I really liked getting into sustainability because it allowed me to not pigeonhole into one specific sort of discipline. You see a lot of folks in architecture where they'll start working in their career and they'll end up being a healthcare exclusive or a residential exclusive sort of specialist. And being in sustainability, I've gotten a wide exposure to a variety of commercial and residential sort of projects and what the needs are and challenges and really has helped um, sort of understand the wide complexity of challenges that affect the industry as you approach different project types, different um, goals, but then understanding kind of what the universal sort of comparisons and truths are that exist between projects of just how you approach sustainability within a project. Mm -hmm. So you and I have been going around the country and in some cases around the world talking to architects about uh, the open data that's coming, the cloud-based tools that are coming, the automation that's coming to practice. And I just wanted to ask your opinion as a licensed architect recently in practice before getting into a startup company. What do you see as the impact not only on sustainability and the sustainability outcomes and how these tools and automation is gonna affect that, but also on just the business and the practice of architecture. Yeah, I think that those, the automations that are coming are really something that the, the design industry should embrace as much as possible, because I think that it enables designers to really start to focus their effort and energies on the things that are impactful and meaningful to them. So if you're looking at from a sustainability standpoint, you can use these automations to more quickly run different sort of simulations and look at different outcomes for different options of scenarios to help refine sort of what your approach is much faster than sort of the current process where you might be modeling, you know, and having to put a lot of manual data entry in and you're almost in some cases checking your results as opposed to trying to predict and actually actively respond to different parameters. Um, I think that also holds true for the general 
business of architecture and that if you can free up some of this busy work time, you know, maybe you don't have to spend a ton of time doing bathroom elevations if they're all the same or specifying, you know, the same standard materials all the time. Um, it really, again, lets you move to sort of your fee structure based on value and adding value to the clients where they can see sort of you're embracing what their mission, their goals are, and really helping drive those more sort of experiential sort of, you know, artistic spaces than the general dirty sort of detailed work that needs to happen. So if I were going to paraphrase what you just said, the earlier engineering simulation, the ability to do it and, and make some key decisions earlier so that you don't get pigeonholed into a bad decision you have to live with, where later when you check it, you just realize it would be too much work to redo it. That will help on the sustainability outcomes for these projects, but also just the automation and the, the lowering the amount of time that's needed to get to that certain stage uh, is going to profoundly affect the business. What do you think it's going to what kind of impact is it going to have from a business standpoint? I think it's going to really allow uh, architects to focus on sort of the more premier sort of spaces and experiential sort of items so that instead of spending their time on uh, studying a ton of different, you know, sort of Lego, you know, like moving around to pieces to get them to fit together in sort of the footprint, if they can do some of those studies and analysis early to come up with kind of their initial layout, it allows them to just leapfrog farther and faster into the design process to have deliverables done sooner, being able to spend more time on sort of, you know, those spaces that create the experience of a, of a place, you know, the actual sort of the things that are strongly related to the party and sort of the expression of the general goals of the design, as opposed to, you know, spending a lot of time in just those initial massing layouts and early studies. And so I think the ability to shift the focus from, you know, getting those automation pieces that drive sort of the early studies, early, you know, done for you, it just allows sort of a better quality of outcome a better value that you can provide to your clients because you can actually spend your time where it's meaningful. That's great. And uh, so as a as the next segment in today's impact on the profession and on the outcomes and the built environment, we're going to have Daryl Patterson, who was doing this uh, same sort of uh, work with Lendlease, a large owner, um, owner developer, and so we're going to shift over to Daryl Patterson. So I want to thank you for your time today, Christina, and uh, compare notes with Daryl on um, on what he thinks is going to drive the changes that this is going to drive in the in the built environment and in the practice of design. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Welcome, everybody. With me, I have Daryl Patterson, who was instrumental in Len Lease's uh, design build efforts and in the creation of a system called Podium. Daryl, welcome. Thanks for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. And your unique perspective on how to systematize the process is going to be super valuable to everybody in the challenge. Uh, thanks, Marty. And, and thanks for the opportunity to um, share some words with you. It's a, it's a topic that's sort of near and dear to my heart and has been for a long time. And maybe to explain a little bit about how that came to be. Um, about 30 years ago, I graduated as an architect in a really bad time, it was a, a major economic um, downturn and nobody was hiring architects. Uh, so I got lucky. I got offered a job as a construction project manager for, a, for an Australian company called Lendlease. And I knew of them, didn't know much about them. And I thought this would be a temporary job. Well, it turned out it was nearly 30 years. Um, and uh, it took me a lot of places and a lot of different experiences but what happened is I spent six or seven years in construction and nearly 20 years in real estate development. And in the latter stages of that, I became very disillusioned with what I saw in the industry, the same problems, the same inefficiencies, the same increasing costs. Uh, and I thought there has to be a better way. And we spent nearly 10 years looking for a better way. And we looked at many different things from material and construction technologies and ultimately ended with um, a digital technology approach. So my role culminated in me being the chief product officer for Lendlease Digital and also head of design for that entity. And we created a number of things out of that, uh, including some software, which we called uh, Podium. 
and uh, it's it's starting to do some really interesting stuff. But it's in a world where a lot of people are doing similar things um, with different intentions. And I think our intention was really how do we make great buildings that are functional, that are attractive, um, but using technology that is really efficient and scalable. And I think those sort of strategic aspects to this is something that the industry is yet to really grasp a hold of. So Podium is really interesting, and uh, it always begs the question, with all of these tools that are generative, will owners stop hiring architects? What do you think? Yeah, look, as we were working on that, a number of people said, oh, that must be our goal, that we're trying to push different people out of the industry. We're trying to displace them. We're trying to capture their fee as part of the savings or profit on the project. And, you know, that's kind of a nonsense in my view. Uh, and I don't just say that because my background was training as an architect. Uh, I think we we look at a certain role like what an architect does and we say, oh, they produce drawings. So it's not really why you hire an architect, right? Yes, you want drawings from them, but you actually want their creativity. You might also want their ability to manage and solve risk and problems. Uh, and they add a lot to the, to the solution that, isn't represented in a stack of drawings necessarily. So I think these technologies, I don't think at all displace these roles. I think they augment them and change their ability to, to service a wider number of projects more efficiently. Yeah, and I think it's really important to identify what is intangible value that early owners recognize architects bring to the equation to make their projects more attractive and make them more marketable in the first place. One thing I want to unpack before we get into the software side of this, because it's the software side is super interesting, but um, I first got introduced to this in an effort uh, at LendLease called Design Make, where there was a whole hardware side to this that was really driven around sustainability and taking what were at the time concrete apartment buildings and office buildings and moving them to cross-laminated timber and much more sustainable materials. Now, one of the things I'm going to do as we talk uh, uh, is just to illustrate our points, put some visuals up. So as we describe this, I'm going to put up that video of the time lapse of the concrete versus the CLT build, um, which is now almost 10 years old. Uh, that was the basis of design make and then what you guys were doing at Podium. So if you can just describe that effort, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, this was part of the search for just doing things a better way. And we started, um, as a lot of people do, with the construction method and the construction materials. And I'd been in Europe at some point and seen cross-laminated timber. Um, a, a great nine-story building had been created in London called at Murray Grove. And that was a precedent for us that we took and ran with. When we took it back to the Australian marketplace, there were no, there were no um, capabilities around mass timber at that time. So we actually stood up a whole business called Design Make that had a design function. And as the name would imply, it also had a factory that could take imported CLT and manufacture building components from it. And it also had some other capabilities around um, pre-fabricated uh, internal wall systems. Uh, I think we had some tremendous outcomes from that. We built some really beautiful buildings that we're very proud of and that you know, have achieved global recognition. And from a sustainability point of view, it's kind of off the charts, right? You've got this super low carbon process. You've got buildings that had you know, dramatically less impact um, when they were being constructed in terms of fewer truck movements and fewer resources. They're even quieter to build, right? Every single dimension of it is, is very positive. But ultimately, when you look at it, Things like cross-laminated timber and, and timber structures are a key part of a solution, but they're, they're insufficient by themselves. Right. They don't bring you the whole story. Because we would say to people with that business, we can make anything. Now, if we can make anything, we don't have a product. We just have a service that can make anything. And so while we could make anything, we couldn't necessarily make it more efficiently because we hadn't become practiced at doing a product. Um, now, I'm, I'm pleased that mass timber is really taking off around the world. I think the design make effort was a catalyst, particularly in the Australian market for that. Um, but ultimately, when you look at it, you say it's a it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. And the way that I think about what you just said is, you know, there's a long history as a craft based industry where every building is engineered to order. And people think about getting a machine because they're used to, you know, nail guns or whatever they've got. So if I get a new machine, I have a new capability. And they think about um, design tools for making whatever artifact they need to get their permits or whatever. 
But I think from both sides, and I'd be interested to hear your comment on this, just paraphrasing it a different way. I think, and this is what, um, you know, the analysts in the industry are describing BIM 2.0. It's not so much about the model as, as about systematizing the process mm -hmm. so that you can template parts of it so that that exact bottleneck of not being able to design enough to a double degree of detail to, to be able to do the means and methods with more confidence is um, is worked out by systematizing the process and putting that in an environment where the data is a lot more accessible in a data-driven workflow as opposed to the kind of file-driven workflows that we've been doing for the last 20-something years or so. Uh, absolutely. And that's that's what evolved from Design Make for our team to what we eventually were doing with Podium was to say, well, you know, we've now learned a whole lot about manufacturing a physical product, right? Um, some some good, some bad. That knowledge now needs to be in the design tools that we use to make the buildings, right? The efficiencies of how we, we make a building with 5% waste or, you know, 30 or 40% waste, all that knowledge needs to be actually institutionalized into the software so that we don't expect human designers to have to learn all of the, the various rules and constraints that will change those waste factors 